The first presentation will be held by uh, Yatsiu from Animoca Brands. So uh, Animoca Brands is a publicly listed game company, rated as one of the top 50 game companies in the world, uh, that is heavily investing in blockchain games and NFTs with brand license from Formula One, uh, Thomas and Friends, uh, Doraemon, uh, Astro Boy, and more. And uh, Yasiu is chairman and co-founder of Animoca Brands and uh, has been an entrepreneur for over three decades in gaming. Uh, his first job was at Atari, uh, and uh, he, he was named a global leader of uh, Tomorrow and Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum, and is a member of the advisory board of uh, BAFTA and uh, British Academy of Film and Television Arts. Uh, please welcome Yatsiu. Thank you. All right, thank you. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the awesome power of NFTs and how it's going to save the games industry. All right. So as mentioned, my name is Yat Siu. I'm the chairman and co-founder of Animoca Brands. Uh, this will be super fast. You don't have to know the details of this, but essentially we are a traditional, we're a traditional mobile game company that decided to go all in on blockchain. Last year we did 17 different blockchain investments. Um, and one of them later on will present itself here, which is the Sandbox, which we're very proud of. Um, some of the projects are, you know, uh, we made an investment in LucidSight, which is basically, you know, the uh, MLB Crypto Baseball, and also um, sort of um, the Crypto Space Commander project. Uh, we also recently did an acquisition where we bought basically Striking, which is fantasy sports with uh, non-fungible tokens and sort of uh, fantasy sports um, on the blockchain. And um, most recently, uh, we also announced, actually we did an auction for it just now, but we launched a deal with Formula One where we have the exclusive rights to do a blockchain game based on Formula One. And of course, Sandbox, but I'll let Seb discuss Sandbox afterwards. All right, enough advertising. All right, so now let me talk about sort of our industry and why do we as a traditional games company feel that it is really important to be looking at blockchain. As you can see, this is one of the forecasts. Depends who you talk to. Our industry will become 130. Some people say $150 billion industry. And that looks pretty good, right? Obviously, it looks like the numbers are growing up. But in the traditional games business, we have one problem. It's the fact that it's 6.2%, which is really bad news, right? It means that we are in an industry, in a traditional game space that is mature. And I think you can see this today already whether you look at the growth of most game companies broadly around the world, it is growing, but it is growing slowly, right? When the emergence of the rapid pace of growth came, it came from a new source, and that was mobile at the time. But now, everyone has a mobile phone, so the growth is essentially stuck. And one of the reasons why this growth is stuck is not because there's like, two billion gamers out there, so it's not an issue of audience, is because conversion from freemium, which is the business model that overtook the industry. Originally it was paid games, then it became freemium games, is around 1.5%, in some cases two, and if it's really good, 3% conversion. And you can see that when you analyze the financial reports of all of the major listed companies that do basically mobile games, they talk about you know, their ARPDAO and their conversion rates. So why is it that when someone plays a game, 99 or 98% actually don't spend any money. Most people actually play for free and only a small number convert. So there are many reasons, but one of the reasons I want to surmise, particularly in the games that have economies, is the fact that an example here is Lineage, which of course everyone in Korea knows really well. It's a legendary game, uh, one of the very first super successful MMOs. And since 1998, seven or eight years ago, had already raked in close to $2 billion, which back then, was a very large number in gaming because the audience wasn't that big. But despite all of its success, in the same year, they shut down their US server. Now, how does a product that make $2 billion globally, but then they shut it down in the US? Now, that's one example. So when you take that example, in the same time, NCSoft, I'm not, I'm not by the way, I'm not picking on NCSoft, just uh, um, shut down City of Heroes as well shortly after. And you can see people were protesting, you know, there was a big change.org campaign that says save our city of heroes. For those of you who remember, it went viral on Facebook 
and on Twitter because they were really trying to stop it. And City of Heroes was maybe not billions of dollars, but was still a tens of millions of dollars revenue project. So what happens when you shut that down? So one of the challenges is in the gaming industry today, we actually only play for fun and entertainment. We don't own anything. Right? So it's a bit like when you go to a clothes store and you buy some clothes, and if the clothes company shuts down, your clothes disappear. That's exactly what happens in the game world. You don't get billions of dollars of revenue for people spending one dollar. People have spent, as you may know, especially in Korea, tens of thousands of dollars on their games. What happens to the psychology of a player when you spend tens of thousands of dollars and then it's all gone? Even though you play for entertainment and you realize that it's not supposed to be an investment, you still lost money. So for those of you who have maybe made an investment anywhere around the world, after you lose money, are you that interested in investing again? You'll be more careful. But what happens if that can be changed? What happens if actually when I play a game, I don't actually really end up losing anything, even if the game itself goes? Right? Could we change the way in which we look at our buying and spending behavior? So right now, games is, a, is something where we have lost our trust. Nobody expects a game to last forever. So if it doesn't last forever, why should I invest in it in a serious amount? Why should I convert more? This is where we think non-fungible tokens in the content space will save the day. <laughs> so first, how do we get into this space? Well, I think who here has not heard of CryptoKitties? Okay, great. So I don't have to go into too much detail because we are, after all, in a blockchain event. So, um, but broadly speaking, right, what CryptoKitties did is it introduced the concept of essentially true digital scarcity. And the fact that people were prepared to spend thousands of dollars on a digital item that at that time didn't actually have much utility other than breeding cats, right? That had very unique and scarce features around them. But what became interesting is that people started spending thousands of dollars and also started making money on them as they were breeding, selling, and trading these cats. Right? And it brought the Ethereum network on its knees. Right? That's the background here. And of course, that was made possible because of non-fungible tokens. This concept, which is essentially using the same technology with blockchain that allows fungibility and trade of a Bitcoin, verifying the scarcity and the uniqueness of every item, but at scale. Right? It means that no matter you issue a million or one or five items, you can now certify them as unique as opposed to something that is the same. And you can do that at scale. That's generally mostly what you need to understand. Uh, it's important to note that NFTs themselves are not cryptocurrencies, but they could become an asset. In the past, when you look at scarcity, you can have an art item, something like a Picasso. But in order for you to prove that this Picasso has value, you need a certificate. You need to go somewhere to show that, yes, this Picasso is worth one million or two million or three million dollars. But now with blockchain, this happens automatically, right? And with that, you can also embed permanent value into these items. It doesn't just have to be a skin or look, right? Or separately, when you look at the CryptoKitties, you had people pay over $100,000 at the time for these spare, uh, sort of rare digital cats in the collectible space. But the collectible space in itself is not crazy to think that people spend that kind of money, even for those of you who collect stamps or for those of you who collect baseball cards, they go up to the millions of dollars themselves. So now you can do that on the blockchain with digital scarcity and with non-fungible tokens. And most recently, just uh, last week, we sold uh, our own Formula One car at auction for over 100,000 US dollars in what was arguably, in some cases, considered controversial. We won't have to go into the details. However, the point being that someone actually spent a lot of money on those uh, virtual items. And perhaps the most important thing to note is that outside of the features and the items of it, one thing is certain. This is the very first and can only be the very first Formula One car on the blockchain. Because at minimum, the timestamp ensures that it, can, it is the very first one. There can never be another first one. Right? And that scarcity in itself has value. Whether it's worth $10,000, $100,000, that depends pretty much in the eye of the beholder. 
Now, digital items and collecting for gamers themselves is not something that is entirely new. Right? So obviously in the crypto world, people spend a lot of money on these cards, whether it's a Gods and Chain card or CryptoKitty cards. But here is an example of an item that was basically a skin for Counter-Strike. Right? And the Dragon Lore skin was sold for 61,000 US dollars. It's not even a non-fungible token. But it can be used inside the game and you can show off the skin that you have while you basically kill your enemies. Now, what made it special is because it was signed and autographed by a famous esports champion, which is basically Skadoodle. And this is important to note, because even when you look at items, they may have exactly the same utility. Like a cup that I drink from has exactly the same utility as any other cup. But if I sell it to you, it might be only worth five or $10. But if Michael Jackson owned that cup, is it worth more? It probably is worth more by a lot. Right? even though the cup and the utility is exactly the same. So when you start thinking about things like eSports, suddenly the items that have won a victory or the items that have gotten you to level 50 or beat a boss or whatever that may be, that provenance is embedded every time the item is used. So an item has value as a result, not just because of its function, but also its provenance, its history, its past. It's the reason we pay for artwork. We buy their stories, we don't just buy their function. So that's one problem we're solving, we think, with blockchain. The second one is one around discovery and something that plagues game developers around the world. For those of you who are game developers, you might know the story. But back in 96, uh, Bill Gates penned this essay basically saying content is king. And he penned that essay because back in 96, the internet was just emerging. It was just in the early days and he realized that because of the internet, we would all have incredible access to free and steady information. And that meant in a, in a world where access was freely available, the only thing that could win was supposed to be content and everyone could be a creator. That was the promise. And it would be exciting. But the problem is that even though content itself became abundant, actually, it was worth nothing without distribution. So Jonathan Perelman, who was basically a distribution guy, came up with a counter quote and said, yes, content is king, but distribution is queen and she wears the pants. In other words, without the queen, you're dead, which probably in some of our relationships with our wives might be true too, but anyway. So point is that if you don't actually have any way in which your content can be found, then is your content still worth something? And today, when you take a look at this, can there be a Mario without Nintendo? Can there be a Game of Thrones without HBO? Right? Who owns it? What's more important? And unfortunately today, especially when you look at content outside of games like music, the distributor owns everything, which is why the value of content has become lower. Right? That's something that we think blockchain can fix. However, for now, most of us are using copies. Right? Music is copied. Digital items is copied. There is no value in the items themselves. So therefore, you go to a place to experience your content. Where we think blockchain will change everything is to do basically an add value. Of course, blockchain generally, as a concept, adds value to everything. Right? It's the internet of value. But more importantly, it will add value to the content space broadly, and especially with games. Because now, if imagine all those people who used to play Lineage and Lineage shut down, all those items, if they were non-fungible tokens, if they were on the blockchain, you still own the items. So you might ask, well, I have these items from Lineage, that's great, but why would I do anything with them if the game is dead? The difference is, because they're non-fungible tokens, someone else can make a game to take advantage of it. So I'll give you an example. I like this example because I play tennis but I don't know how many of you play tennis here. But let's say all of you bought a tennis racket for some reason because some famous K-pop star said, I love tennis, and you'll buy a tennis racket, okay? And you would have five million tennis rackets, new five million owners of tennis rackets. But there are no tennis courts. How many people would open a tennis court? Probably a lot, because they see a business opportunity, because all these people have tennis rackets, so I'm gonna open some tennis courts. 
Is it 10? Is it 100? Is it 1,000? Supply and demand. I don't know. But that's exactly what's going to happen here. All the people who lost their game, whether it's City of Heroes, or whether it's Lineage, or whether it's World of Warcraft in the future, or whether it's Ultima Online, all of those are communities that have items, or could have had items of value. Whether it's a fan-driven community or someone else, they will build content for them. And those items will grow in value. And so what happens is, of course, is that not only do these items become interoperable and permanent, the buyer also has trust. Because he knows that even though the game might not be forever, the item is forever. And that's important. The example I gave you before was when the game was dead, you lost everything. Why would I ever pay a lot of money for another game? But now I have it forever. And we think this is going to change the buying behavior. So that means we think a future where content is valuable is going to be such that the content is the platform. That means that in the future, companies will make games based on what you own, not necessarily where you go. Today, you go to a place to find your entertainment. You go to the App Store, you go to Google Play, right? or you go to HBO. But if I know that you have lineage items, then I can target you with a world meant for you. Right? And that's how communities build value. And instead of the game itself being the ecosystem of value, it should be the items. Because the items themselves become more valuable as more games make use of them. And by themselves, the difference here, of course, is that in the real world, a physical item loses value maybe because it depreciates because it just gets used. But in a digital world, that can't happen. So it's permanent. Right? So that's kind of where we think the future will go. And in a way, we've seen this before, right? Minecraft is such an example, except it's not on the blockchain, which means the items aren't transferable. But you've seen a world in which is quasi-decentralized, where people can set up their own servers, set up their own mods, and it's kind of owned by a community instead. Now, to conclude, well, how do I think this is going to save the games industry for growth? $70 billion last year was generated in freemium mobile games. So whether it's Clash Royale, whether it's, you know, um, you know, uh, <coughs> you know um, sort, of, uh, um, sort of any other freemium game, that $70 billion came from a conversion that is less than 3 or 2 or 1%. Because as I said earlier, very few people spend actually freemium money. Which means, that if there's simply a 1% additional conversion, that's $25 billion of increased market. We're not talking about converting 10%. We're talking about converting 1%. That's $25 billion globally. Now imagine, if you knew, if you knew that the items you're spending could maybe have value, that there was scarcity in the model, that I could sell and trade these items, at least I don't lose my money maybe, or at least I can pass them on, Will I more likely spend? Will I have more certainty to, sh to know that these items are not lost? Right? That's, that's what this is about. And we think that true ownership is going to increase the conversion rate, not by 1% or 2%, but by 10 or 20%, as it should. Because now, the trust will be there. The blockchain gives it the trust that the items are permanent through the non-fungible tokens, which means that this could become the growth of an industry that will not grow 6 or 8% as forecasted, but could grow 10 times to maybe a trillion dollar industry, because now we will trade and own virtual items in the way that we do physical items. Thank you very much. <laughs>